So I think we are we are live. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session, this afternoon session in the in the Ushuaia room. Uh, we are going to have uh, an afternoon packed of presentations, exciting presentations, uh, and my my first guest here today. Uh, which is already on the screen, is uh, Matthew Anson. He develops software for the use and analysis of remote sensing data. And he, he let me add that he is also a core contributor to the stack specification. So today, uh, Matt is going to be talking about uh, how to get start uh, with stack for uh, public data sets. And so, the floor is yours, uh, Mike. Thank you, Joanna. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great being here. Um, wish it was in person. I think everybody says that. I'm actually wearing my Calgary Phosphor G shirt. Um, I, I hear that it's a collector's item. So today I'm going to be talking about getting started with Stack for Public Data Sets. I actually changed the title a little bit uh, from what was in the abstract in calling it Scalable and Reproducible Science, since that's really, that's really what we're after here, is this concept of analysis in place. You might have heard of the Pangeo community and Stack of Software, and this is a new paradigm in scientific computing, really, where we bring the algorithms to the data. So the algorithms are next to and running on data in the cloud. Uh, there's no need to download the data. The, da the data doesn't move to, uh, to, to the local server for processing. Uh, it reads it remotely and holds it in memory and processes it. And the way that we do this is by using X-Array and Dask, and we interact with that through a Jupyter Notebook. And this is a really powerful way of doing things. Uh, anything that you can do in NumPy, you can do in X-Array. Uh, X-Array offers really a few benefits over NumPy. Uh, for one is all the axes are labeled, so you don't actually have to know uh, or, um, or remember or figure out what dimensions are what. You have a time dimension, an X and a Y dimension, a band dimension, or, or however many dimensions it is. And when you do computations, you can specify labels. So it's a really natural way of interacting with the data. Um, and the API is the same as for NumPy. So if you're used to using NumPy, then you should be able to switch to using X-Array. The other big advantage of X-Array is that it doesn't actually have to be backed on the back end by NumPy arrays. It can be NumPy arrays. So it's really just a layer on top of that. But it can also be backed by Dask arrays. And Dask is a way to um, lazy, lazily read in, store, and process data uh, so that when you first make computations, you don't actually read in the data and perform that computation. Instead, you have a graph uh, that describes the computation being done, and you continually can add to that. Uh, and when you go to compute, then it will run everything. Uh, and it'll read in the data, run everything, and output it. So you're only needing to do the computation when you need it, such as when you are going to display or when you want that, that final output. Um, there are multiple ways to make these X arrays from stack. Um, there's a library called Stack Stack, which, was, uh, which, which is a great library. Um, there's also something called Open Data Cube. And Open Data Cube traditionally has been uh, its own its own library, its own thing. Uh, it, it predates the development of Stack, um, and it w uses a Postgres backend database to store all this metadata about your data. So really the main thing here is that it points to where the data is located. So you could have lots of different files, lots of different files over a time series, let's say Landsat data, uh, and the database holds where those are located, along with some other metadata that's needed about the size of the array and the geotransform. So it can, it can make an X-array out of that. Recently, in cooperation with, um, with ODC 
and with Microsoft for the Planetary Computer, uh, we have created ODC Stack. So this is just a tool, uh, an additional library. You install pip install ODC Stack. It uses DataCube, uh, and it removes the need for this backend Postgres database. And instead, you can just load data from a Stack API. Or more specifically, you just load data from Stack items. So you can query a Stack API, get those items, and now you can use those resulting items and load them into your open data cube. So a geospatial cloud workflow, like I've been talking about here, is really there's a few really important technologies that needed to be in place in order for this to really work. And we're, we've gotten a lot closer and we're really at an exciting time where we have this data discovery piece through Stack. We have more and more data in these cloud native formats so we can perform windowed reads on them and we have this lazy array processing. Um, combined with JupyterHub, uh, we can go end to end and we can start with a Stack query. And this is really powerful because we can start our analysis with not an existing set of data, but we can pick any area or time range that we want and point it and get it and run it through our same workflow. So I'm going to give a example here. I'm going to walk through a, um, a notebook. And so this is going to really be more of a, a tutorial. I'm not actually going to run the notebook. I've learned the hard way that that's generally not a good idea to do. So I've pre-run this. And you might have gone to some of the tutorials in the planetary computer. Uh, this is going to be um, similar to that, except here we're using Open Data Cube to actually do the creation of the X-Array. So the first cell here is just some boilerplate code and some functions that I'll be using later. This is really where it starts right here. This is where we open up the Stack API. So we give it the URL of the planetary computer API. This, If you go here, this is a, a JSON endpoint. You'll see that it has a bunch of link uh, links to it to go to collections and ultimately the, the underlying data. You can browse through it. Um, but here we're just putting in this root catalog and we're opening it up. It's called Microsoft PC. Um, we're going to grab the collection Sentinel-2 L2A. And what I'm doing here is I'm just printing what the assets are. So assets in a stack item are the actual underlying data files. So here uh, we've got, we see we have all of our bands. We see that they're in this cloud optimized geotiff. Uh, we have a name for them so we can make sense of what these actually are. Uh, you also see that there's some other non image data here. And those are assets too in stack. Um, they're additional metadata. Perhaps this is the original granule metadata, uh, the manifest file for the safe archive. Uh, these are all considered assets because they're part of that scene, part of that item. Um, next up, I'm going to actually do a search here. So I search uh, for this collection that I wanted uh, using uh, a geometry that I'm, I'm opening up here. This is um, in Northern California, north of Sacramento where there was a big fire in uh, September and October of 2020. So we're going to search um, and look for uh, a two-year time period here, roughly, 2019 through almost the present. And we're looking for items with a low cloud cover. So here we actually fetch the items. I turn them into a GeoPandas data frame here because it's really convenient to be able to look at um, look at that data. Here I'm just looking at the first five just to see, yeah, this is my stack data. Um, I see that there's a, there's a, there's some scenes here. If you can see, these actually have the same date. Okay, and that's because Sentinel data is tiled. So here I'm plotting the AOI that I picked, this is the uh, around where the fire was. And then these are all the sent the footprints of the Sentinel tiles that were found. Now I mentioned that there are some with the same dates. So we found 133 scenes, but this is just inconveniently located on this tile boundary. I don't know about you, but every time I pick an AOI, I always feel like I hit tile boundaries. And the top and the bottom tile, there's some that will be on the same date. Well, 
Open Data Cube can handle that, no problem. Um, and then we'll just end up combining those and we'll see that in a second. So now we're gonna actually load this thing. We've all we've done is search, we've gotten the items. Now we're gonna use Open Data Cube. Uh, I'm providing some additional configuration information here. Now in the long term, this is not gonna be needed. Uh, part of this effort in coming up with, uh, in generating ODC stack was to identify uh, pieces of metadata that are needed in the stack record in order to effectively use uh, use ODC in order to load the data without hitting the data files. Again, we only want to look at the metadata and create these data cubes without actually looking at any data. And so you do need certain things. You need the geotransform, uh, you need the shape of the array and the projection. Uh, and here we don't have in, in this stack catalog, we don't have the data types. Now you could just assume that everything is float and that could work, uh, but in the future, um, best practices for stack are going to be to include the raster projection, uh, the raster extension to stack, which includes the ability to specify data types in your assets as well. So in the future, in a stackified world where all these stack records are complete, we, we should have that information. But for now, I'm just augmenting it. And here I'm going to load. So I'm using the stack load function. Uh, I'm telling it what bands I want. I don't want to open up all the bands right now. So I'm opening up red, green, blue, and the near IR band. I'm also specifying my chunks. Now, this is, it doesn't explicitly say use Dask, but that's what you're doing when you specify chunks. You're saying use Dask. If you don't specify chunks here, it's just going to read everything and you'll have those X arrays that are backed by numpy arrays rather than Dask, but we want to use the power of Dask. And we can also specify our output CRS and our resolution. Uh, this is the stack configuration here that uh, is this YAML that I, I uh, additional info. Uh, and then finally, this patch URL is just a convenience function to hand in. What it will do is uh, the this is a planetary computer function that will sign the URLs because those URLs need to be signed. So we hand in the function that will automatically sign those and we'll sign all the URLs before it actually fetches it. Now this took no time at all. We loaded it. You see, it just took it took 1.8 seconds here uh, because it didn't actually read the data. And we see uh, we see our array here. So this is uh, we have a few different we have four, these four different data variables, and we have uh, um, an array that's 10,000 by 20,000 and 85 time points. Now remember we actually found 133 scenes. So, but here there's only 85 different time points. And that's because we had a lot of duplicated time points in the top and the bottom arrays. Those have been merged into one time slice. So we have 85 unique days. And this makes sense, 10K by 20K, because it's two sentinel tiles up uh, top and bottom. Now, of course, we don't want all of the sentinel tiles we really want to clip these down to our area of interest. So here we can use Rio X-Array, and there's, a, there's a open, another open data cube function uh, to do this, but I wanted to illustrate uh, the fact that once ODC is in X-Array, then you can really use anything that can use X-Arrays. Um, there is really a, not a lot of standardization here. That's something that I think will be um, worked on in the future. Uh, to, for better standardization of, of how X-arrays are constructed. Uh, but Rio X-ray will work with the Open Data Cube X-arrays. And here we're using the clip functionality and I'm providing it my geometry. And now if we look at one of these data variables, we see it's quite a bit smaller. It's only 1200 by 1000 pixels because that's the area of that AOI. Next, I'm gonna run an ODC algorithm on it here just to convert it to an RGB image. All right, so now we see we have our 85 time points and we have four band images. We have red, green, blue, and an alpha channel for indicating transparency. Uh, and this didn't take, again, no time at all. This was just instantaneous. It just reconstructs this X-ray and this is going to be the expected output without actually hitting the data. And then we also do the same here. We're going to calculate NDVI. So we do uh, this normalized difference. We take the difference uh, over the sum of these bands. We're gonna clip it to the zero to one range. Uh, we call it NDVI and we print that out. And you see 
Now this is just a one band image. It's 85 time slices by that. Uh, and there's no data variables here because it's just that's just one data variable, NDVI. So now we've done all this. It's not taken any time really um, to do so. There's been no computation. And all this has happened within this notebook. So we really want to use Dask here. So we can start uh, the way to do it in planetary computer is to use Dask Gateway, which will start a cluster on the planetary computer. Uh, and I have this. I had previously run this. <coughs> Excuse me. I previously run this, and this is the, the nice status dashboard that Dask gives us, which is uh, really pretty cool when you run it and see everything move. Uh, so I had done that, uh, and then I computed. I did this by calling the persist function. So what persist does is it actually uh, makes the call to Dask. It'll read in the data. It'll compute it all, uh, and, it, and it stores it. It persists it on the cluster. So that later on you can uh, excuse me, uh, Matthew. Do you think it's possible to make the font a bit larger, the the font of the notebook? Yeah, you can do that. That'll be great. Thank you. All right, let's do that. Yeah. And I will have these aren't currently publicly available, but they will be by um, uh, sometime today. There'll be a there'll, a link. Be, um, a, a link, yeah, uh, with a GitHub repo. So, all right, is that a little bit better? Can you see that? Okay. Uh, if you if you just hit uh, the control plus in the in the tab, um, I think if I make it a little bit smaller here, does that help? Um, I was wondering if you can hit control plus and and make it a bit. Uh, I think that's working. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. All right, how's yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 much better. Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Sorry for that. Um, I, I won't go back and uh, do the rest, but um, okay. So here, all right. So we've got the dask array. So um, we persist the data. So I have this NDVI and this viz array, uh, data cubes that I had created. Okay. Uh, derived data cubes. This is again. This is AD, NDVI. See. We have this normalized difference just going back here so you can see uh, here was the rgb uh, image we use this two rgba function here's the data cube um we just scaled it from the one to three thousand and this was the rio x array call here okay so all right so now we started our dask client we persisted it um and now we actually want the data so we're just going to call compute and that essentially is going to fetch the data and deliver it to me. Um, you can actually call compute instead of persist, but persist, you generally want to do this first so that the data is persisted on, on the cluster. Uh, and here we see all of our images. So this took, uh, as you can see here, uh, this took just about 40 seconds to hit those 133 files um, and fetch the data and clip it and process it. Um, and we see here, of course, I didn't do any like outlier, uh, throwing out outliers. There's a couple images here that there's uh, clearly an issue. These, this has a lot of clouds, even though I filtered out clouds. I did 25% clouds or less. Looks like the 25% of the clouds in that scene was all over this AOI. Um, and we see that we're on the tile boundary because some, some data is just not complete and that's to be expected. So. Um, we also see, okay, and then here I'm actually um, using the hollow views library and HVplot to uh, have an interactive slider. And the window's a little small here, so it's hard to see, but um, you can actually drag and go through the images. Now, um, I'd like to point out, we see a lot of green up here. So this is a little bit dark, but it's green. This is all green. And then we reach a point where so you see this is brown. This was the time period of the fire. We see a lot of uh, haze and smoke here. This is actually um, uh, from the fire here. Um, this might be clouds, but you know you see a lot of smoke, and you can actually see the glowing fires here as well. in, in, in this uh, September 26th, if you were to blow it up, and then we have all this brown because all the vegetation is burnt. 
and we can see that if we cycle through here um, we can we can jump through the images see that's green and then when we go later on this is this is all brown um, but it's an RGB image so it's not as easy to tell so we can plot the MDVI here so this is the MDVI dark blue is uh, dark blue is is near one so that's lots of greenness all right in this light blue so, and we can do the same thing here. If we jump all the way to the end, um, we see that we have a lot of light blue. Another thing that we can do, uh, it's a lot easier than flipping through, is we can just create an animated GIF. Um, I think that uh, animated GIFs are probably one of the greatest technological marvels in the last several years um, because the power of just being able to, like, have a really compatible way, way to view moving pictures that you can send to people. Um, it's, it's not just for memes anymore. Um, it, this is great because you can quickly visualize uh, this and you can send it off and it's really quite interoperable. You can send it to anybody. So here we see uh, color schemes a little different than what I chose above here. But uh, of course, the dark green, the green is, is, is greenness and vegetation and yellow is not. Um, the timestamp is up here. Uh, but you see it's when it turns all yellow, that's actually um, before and after the fire. We could also do computations. Here we're calculating the mean and then compute. This happens nearly instantaneously because all the data has been persisted on the cluster. Uh, and it returns the now a numpy backed X array. And we can plot that. Uh, we see lots of outliers here. But yes, we do clearly see if we're just looking, this isn't really a, a, a great way to do this uh, thorough, uh, thorough analysis, of course. This is just taking the average over the whole, over each time slice. And we see, of course, there is a big drop in the NDVI showing the lack of uh, vegetation there. So that's that notebook. And uh, I knew I wasn't going to get to the other one, but I do have another example notebook. I'm not going to go all the way through it. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show the Landsat Collection Two archive because this is a this is an archive going back to 1972, uh, and all that data is on AWS. And there's there's a brand new Stack API that's up, and uh, we can do the same the same thing. Uh, here, this notebook is just running locally; it's not running on my planetary computer, and I um, can do the same thing. I can look at the assets. I can look at the footprints. Here, I have a, a footprint of Malawi. And you see, this is actually is a different case because it's crossing multiple path rows. All of those will be mosaiced into one into each time slice, uh, and then um, the the rest of the notebook is very much the same. So I'm not going to go through it. And I hadn't I hadn't previously run it. So um, so that's it. So we can really use the same uh, formula here to point to any stack API, and we can load those into data cubes and do operations. We have options for how to use a DAS cluster. Uh, so um, I'll get to that in a second, the, the last final slides here. So the Planetary Computer Hub, to get started, you can request access from, from the Planetary Computer. You would start a Jupyter Lab from the Hub. You can start a terminal there, and you can clone this notebook, which is not yet available, but will be. Uh, and then from the Jupyter Lab file browser, you can open and you can open this notebook that I just went through, and, and you can run that. Uh, and because I didn't want to run it all, I, I wanted to show how Dask worked. And this is the Dask uh, st uh, uh, status page that's showing it actually doing the processing of that planetary computer data. So we kick that off. We have 25 workers running. And it uh, hit those 133 files. And uh, we see it took just about uh, it, it took just about 15, 20 seconds to, to run it all. Uh, with the Landsat Collection 2, we're, we, you can clone the notebook. There's a Docker file. Uh, you, can, you can stand up a local um, container that, that runs notebook. You can open the Landsat notebook. Uh, and here you have a few options. You can either just run lo Dask locally, which isn't going to be next to the data, so it's going to take a lot longer to download the data because it's actually fetching the data and running Dask on your computer, but still better than not using Dask in many ways. You can use Coiled I.O., which is a, a great new um, startup uh, that's been around for a year or so, which will uh, takes away a lot of the pain of creating clusters. Uh, and, you, and they host it and um, have a great uh, 
dashboard that really that gives you pricing uh, whenever you run stuff. This is perhaps one of the best features right here is that you can go and really see what this costs for a small run, and then you could you could ramp that up. Uh, so that's really nice. Um, or you can use Dask Gateway and start up a Dask cluster with any cloud provider. And that's it. Uh, it looks like I'm just about on time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Uh, it looks like a, a game changer for uh, for finding and processing uh, EO images. We, we have uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, so I'll start with, uh, well, the first one is um, you already you already mentioned that uh, you are going to um, make it available for um, so I, yeah I, I, yeah I will have the, yeah, yeah I'll have the uh, we'll have a um, we'll have a repository up on the element 84 github um, I'm gonna try and get that up um, after after this so it'll be up by the end of the day uh, and it will have these two notebooks in it and uh, also, I'll be making a PR to the Planetary Computer example notebook. So when you go to Planetary Computer and you start a fresh account, you automatically get this Planetary Computer folder that's filled with a bunch of examples. And, and this one for the Sentinel-2 uh, will be added to that because it will be the first example notebook using Open Data Cube. Excellent. So uh, the next question will be, uh, is there a a stack equivalent for um, public data sets? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it like, like, oh, stack equivalent for vector data? For vector data sets. Um, yeah, so there isn't, well, there is. I mean, so your vector data would probably be in a, you would have that in a, um, in a, uh, in a, OGC API fe features endpoint. Um, and the metadata isn't, you don't have the metadata describing like raster data and assets like you would with vector data, but you'd still have that on an API. And if you're using something like GeoPandas uh, or Pandas, uh, probably GeoPandas to like manipulate that vector data, uh, you, can, you can back those GeoPandas operations with Dask as well. Uh, so it's not just NumPy and X-Array, like you can have pandas. In fact, you can run anything on Dask. You just have regular functions and you can use Dask to delay that and and farm it out onto a cluster. Excellent. So the next one will be, what are the benefits of using uh, Open Data Cube and Stack Load rather than Stack Stack? So uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess the answer is that Open Data Cube is um, has been around for a while, and it has a really big, rich community, um, and it has a steering committee, and it's just it's established, and they have a lot of example notebooks, um, and I think it has some features that Stack Stack doesn't have right now, uh, but um, and it's I think this is a bigger developer community working on the larger open data cube ecosystem. Um, but Stack Stack does pretty much the same thing in a different way. Um, I'm not sure if it, uh, I ha I've used that in demos as well. Uh, it's, it, it works great. Um, there's some things I don't think it, it handles yet, like um, combining things from the same day, um, reading, um, projection information that doesn't have an EPSG code. There's some open issues for that. Uh, but I, I hope that these things will, I hope that will grow and also that could be another alternative. I, I, I What I'd really like to see is all these tools um, come and use some sort of standard way of constructing the X-arrays so that things are more interoperable between all of these different libraries. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so. I'm moving to the, the next question. It's uh, for non-spatial data in stack, how does one interact with data? Would you need to transfer the entire data to the cluster? Can you do subqueries? Well, you wouldn't have non-spatial data in stack really. Um, but I mean, it wouldn't, I mean, if the question is more like how about Dask, um, 
I mean, you could still do the same. I mean, DASC is universal, right? It doesn't need geospatial data. Uh, it's used for uh, for processing medical imagery. And uh, in fact, there's folks that have used the whole Pangeo uh, stack of software to do like brain brain imaging um, on that. So um, you can, in with subqueries, uh, there isn't, I guess that's one thing that stack stack actually does if it's geospatial data is that it stores a lot of the stack metadata. So you can sort of partition things after you load it. Um, but really the preferred way would be in, in a, or the most common way in a lot of cases is to query the stack data and have separate queries. Um, but you could, you could certainly filter those results. I'm not sure if I really answered the question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matteo. We unfortunately we are running out of time, but we have we have uh, we have more questions in the, in the top questions. So if you can answer in the chat later, it will be great. Uh, and I think um, I let me give you a virtual clap uh, and thank you for your presentation. And we'll move to to our next speaker. Great, thank you very much. <laughs>